The Apostle John wanted his people that he loves so deeply to have unwavering faith. And we're looking during this season at his letter to those people. It's 1 John, which is in our New Testament towards the end of, of your Bibles. And we're looking to see what he says and how he encouraged them and how we can be encouraged to have unwavering faith. And today we look at unwavering truth. And it's, it's amazing to me as I studied and as I prepared to, to recognize how vital that is in our generation, just as it was in the first century AD. Because truth seems very elusive to us right now. And the reality, it is the repercussions of a fallen world. God created a perfect world. Adam and Eve were living in perfection. And then the very first mainstream media moment happens. And they're told, did God really say? And that question has haunted mankind for the duration of our existence. Did God really say? And of course, the intent, what Satan would love for ha to have happen in that moment is for us to begin to question and ultimately succumb to the question because the ultimate question is not just what God said, but does God have any validity in my life or in my experience? So truth becomes not just a matter of facts and issues and concerns or lifestyles or ethics or morals. Truth becomes an issue in the very heart of who God is. Can I trust him? Does what he say to me, is it valid? Is it real? Is, is, it, is it substantive? Is it, is it provable? Is it trustworthy for me to invest my heart? John operates from a perspective there. He has already come to his conclusion. The truth that God brings is always worth investing our lives in. That's the perspective. That's the filter he's coming from. But he recognizes his young friends that he's writing to, has not, they don't have the life experience he's had. And it hasn't been tested. They're in the testing. And he wants them to have some, what I believe are really practical applications regarding truth. Unwavering truth. And so in 1 John, in chapter 4, in the very first verse, he begins to talk about understanding how truth works in our life. Understanding how we can discern and determine truth. And how we can trust truth, which ultimately means we can trust God. And so in verse one, so first John chapter four, verse one, he says, dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God. Because many false prophets, many false teachers have gone out into the world. John says you need to know, if you're going to have unwavering truth, if you're going to commit your life to truth, if you're going to trust in truth, you're going to need to understand a basic principle. Not everything you hear is true. You need to test, you need to understand that there needs to be a healthy, spiritual, holy skepticism about the information you receive. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit. Not everything we hear is true. And the difficulty is we want to believe in institutions for truth. But what we recognize in our generation is that oftentimes we can't trust institutions for truth. During this last election cycle, a number of us found out that some of the media outlets that we have historically trusted gave us slanted perspective and actually was operating from a perspective that was different than ours. We understand now as adults sometimes looking back that not everything we learned in the trusted institution of education was necessarily always truthful. We've all experienced the pain of a relationship where it turned out that the conversations we had, the information we had assimilated, the, the things that we thought were true weren't always true and we felt betrayed or denied, always injured and always hurt. John says, we know our hazards 
And that doesn't prevent us from having the hurt or the injury, but it helps us understand we live in a perspective where we can honestly, not cynically, not, not, not in some cynical, always skeptical, always sarcastic fashion, but where we can honestly say, what I listen to, what I hear, I am going to evaluate against some standard that helps me discern, helps me determine if it's true. So we don't believe every spirit. We don't believe everything we hear, but we test. We test what we're hearing. We test the spirits behind it because all information ultimately has a spirit behind it in John's mind. John sees the world very clearly. He sees it as the things of God and the things of Satan. He sees it as the things that point towards holiness and to Jesus. And he sees it very clearly as the things that are against or what ultimately he calls antichrist, against God, against his holiness, against Jesus. He sees it very, very clearly. And so he challenges us to test. Because let me go ahead and say this. All of us, if you have been in church life for any length of time, have been hurt by what I actually think is one of the most grievous injuries of falsity. We were hurt by a church where we thought what we were hearing was true and it turned out not to be. Where we thought maybe we were learning truth and then there was some question. Where we thought we were a part of an institution that was the best of what institutions should be, not something to be avoided, but something that is established and trustworthy only to find out that it wasn't. Even in church, we should test what we hear because not everything we hear is going to be true. There's a beautiful illustration of that in the book of Acts. The people of a city named Berea came to listen to the apostles and every time they came, they pulled out their Bibles, not just to look at the reference that was being taught, but to make sure that everything they were hearing was in line with the scripture. That's why here at First Baptist Church Tomball, you look at our four core values. One of those core values is always about being biblical. It's always about applying biblical principles. It's always about learning and understanding and testing against the hardcore, absolute truth of Scripture, the Word of God. We test, and it's okay to test, because not always Everything, I mean, and I'm, not, and I'm in a sense incriminating myself. We should test what I say against the filter of Scripture. Because we should be like those Bereans and we should ask ourselves and think through and contemplate is what I'm hearing true? I should know my hazards, and my hazards are I live in a world where untruth, where lies, where falseness is actually reigning in this period of time. Until Jesus returns and sets these things right once and for all, I live with this need to filter and discern. But if I'm going to know my hazard, then if I'm going to test, how do I test? And and John gives us the benchmark. Look at verse 2 and verse 3. This is how you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist. That word John uses over and over again, more than any other author in the New Testament, not to describe a personage, not to describe the Antichrist at the end of time in the book of Revelation, but to describe the spirit that is opposed to God. This spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, even now is already in the world. So we know our hazards, but we also know our benchmark. And the benchmark is very simple. What do they do with Jesus? And from John's perspective, if Jesus is anything other than the son of God, fully divine on his throne, who gave up that throne to come here as a sacrifice for our sins and literally physically died, and literally physically three days later was resurrected so that the power of God conquered sin, conquered evil in that moment. If Jesus is anything other than that, it's wrong. It's false. John, doesn't, John is not trying to find some placated, politically correct moment of a cancel, of a, of a cancel culture that wants to say, no, it's always from my perspective. 
That's from how I want to interpret it. No, John's saying this is the interpretation. Here's the benchmark. Here's the standard. Here, here's the plumb line. Here, here's the level. This is how you know what happens with Jesus. And so if somebody comes to you and says, you know, look, Jesus is a great guy. His teachings are awesome. I, I try to live by the teachings of Jesus. I consider him one of many super teachers throughout history. Well, the, the plumb line says no. That's a lie. You either believe that Jesus is God and that he came in the flesh for the purpose of our salvation and that he resurrected over all evil in his death and in his resurrection and his power was demonstrated or it's wrong. You can't compromise it. And this has been an issue for us over and over and over again because other faiths are good people. You know, that, you, you, this, this isn't about being a good person. This is about what's true and what's false. Good people are false. Good people lie. Right people understand that Jesus is God. And they will understand that. All people will understand that at one point. is because the Apostle Paul screamed that out in the middle of his letter to the church of Philippi. One day, everyone's going to bow. Everyone's going to be on their knees. And they're going to recognize that Jesus is Lord. Because that's the benchmark. And that begins to apply to our morality as well. So I, I watch a movie and I'm watching the movie, and I'm thinking, this doesn't seem correctly, exactly right. This seems like it's off kelter a little bit. And you're saying, but it's not talking about who Jesus is. It's not saying Jesus is a great teacher. It's not saying Jesus was this kind of miracle worker. It's not, it's not questioning whether or not Jesus is God. But the ethics, the morality, the lifestyle that the movie is promoting, when held up to Jesus, is wrong. Every ethical issue we face, when we put it up against the benchmark of the holiness of God, if it's contrary to his character, it's false. So, oh, but in this day of enlightenment, our culture has accepted inclusiveness. I got this really bad news for you. God isn't into inclusiveness. Not at all. He's into exclusiveness. I'm going to walk up to the benchmark one day at the great judgment seat of God as described in the book of Revelation. And I'm going to say, but God, I live this way because in my culture, and God's going to say, I don't recognize you. I don't know you. And my character was holy. But God, you see, we developed since the garden. I know you made one man, I know you made one woman, and you wanted them to be together in marriage, but we learned over thousands of years to evolve that to a different state. And God's saying, no, I didn't make a mistake in the garden. This is the way it is. You don't have to like it because God's never going to force you to trust him, but you will be judged on the basis of whether or not you do trust him. And so now it turns out that that movie I watched, while it may have been totally acceptable to culture and society, it's unacceptable to a holy God. And I can't build my life or build my, the structure of my thought processes on the truths that it wants to convey. And trust me, I can guarantee you, because I experience, I live just like you do, to the best of my knowledge of how you live. Let me just qualify that just a little bit. I'm, I'm out there. I mean, you know, I'm not, we don't, you know, our, our house isn't a monastery. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, we're there. We deal every day. We live in this world, but we don't have to accept this world. You haven't watched a movie, and I'm picking on movies in particular. You have not watched a movie maybe ever in your life, but definitely not in the last four to five decades that didn't have an agenda. They didn't want you to conclude at the conclusion of that movie their version of truth. But you're a believer in Christ. And the movie industry does not determine truth for you. 
Who Jesus is determines truth for you. And what God's word is and says determines truth for us. We got to know our hazards. We live in a false world. We had to know our benchmark, and that benchmark is nothing less than Jesus, live and living, crucified and dead, resurrected, so that you and I could have the freedom to live in truth, not in falsity. Jesus is our benchmark. Now, if you are a part of our world, which I'm assuming everybody, including me, is, right now all these bells are going off in your head. But we got to do this, and but it says this, and my corporation says this, and my company says this, and my administrators say this, and, and my parents said this, and, and my cousin said this, and, 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 it just, and it gets exhausting, quite honestly. The question is, do you have the authority to be unwavering in truth? And John anticipated that in verse 4. This isn't meant to be egotistical. It's not meant to be proud. It's meant actually to humble us and to recognize how blessed we are, how fortunate we are, how, how touched we are because God has given us his truth. But it gives us authority. We, we know our authority. You are from God, little children. And you have conquered them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. I I have my authority not because of my education, not because of my position. I have my authority because on that night when I got down on my knees and I asked Jesus to become the literal king of my life, I said, you take control. In that moment when Jesus took control, I became his. The ownership was transferred from Satan to God. The ownership was transferred from myself to God. The ownership and the destiny was now in the hands of God. And I experienced truth in its purest form, an actual, intimate, personal relationship with God. And I have the right, I have the authority, regardless of what culture says, to determine and discern truth because I am in a relationship with truth. What did Jesus say to the disciples when they were grieving over the potential loss of life that would happen with Jesus? Jesus told them that afternoon, he said, look, I didn't come here to conquer Rome. I didn't come here to do all these things. I didn't come here to make you wealthy. I didn't come here to just make everything better. He said, I came here to save you from sin. And that's going to require my death. And the disciples in John chapter 14, they are literally grieving because that's not what they wanted. They didn't want a suffering servant. They had read about a suffering servant. They had studied about it. They had prayed about it. But they didn't want it in reality. And now they found out that's exactly what they're getting. And Jesus is attempting to remind them that no matter how skewed their perspective was because they had been listening to untruth and they had determined that their situation would be better if Jesus conquered their foes and enemies literally here in this life. Because sometimes when you're living every day, conquering my neighbor, conquering my school, conquering my my boss, conquering my company, conquering my government may seem more important than conquering my sin. And Jesus is reminding me, I came here to conquer sin. Some of this other stuff may happen, but ultimately I came here to conquer sin and give you new life. And so Jesus said to them in all simplicity, but total exclusivity, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you come to, through me, then you know the Father and the Father knows you. It's a relationship based on the truth that is found in the benchmark of Jesus. And that's who we are now. That's where we have the authority to look at scripture and try to understand scripture and interpret it. That's where we have the authority to look at our culture and look at our world around us and say, you know what? That doesn't ring true with the holiness and the character of God. That doesn't ring true with the love of God. That doesn't ring true with the work of God. And not everything we want to happen is automatically the love of God. I'm, I'm, quite honestly, I'm so tired of hearing that from people. Well, if God was a loving God, right. If you grew up with parents that gave you everything, you're just messed up. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And if you had a God who gave you every whimsical desire you had, you would be really messed up. So the fact that God expects some stuff out of us isn't a bad thing. 
But our ability to discern is because we stepped into that relationship with its discipline as well as with its blessing. You are from God. Little children, you have conquered them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They don't have control over everything. We do because we have Jesus in our heart and we've given Jesus full, complete control. And so knowing him is knowing truth. And we understand the source. It's it's a simple description he gives us in verse five. They are from the world. Therefore, what they say is from the world and the world listens to them. You know, I, I hear pastors say that a lot. Well, I'm just frustrated. Nobody seems to listen. If everybody liked everything you said, you should probably question what you're saying. Because not always is truth popular. And it's definitely not popular in culture. It never has been. This isn't a new day. We tend to think that sometimes. I mean, do you think that sometimes? It was never like this. Because maybe it wasn't like that when you were a kid. Maybe you're old enough. It actually wasn't like that when you were a kid. But the truth is there were other stuff going on. You just didn't know it because you were a kid. I mean, the 1950s wasn't the pinnacle of civilization. I know that really damages some of you. And you're like, what do you mean? It was perfect. I mean, that's what they thought in the 1850s. And that's what they thought in the 1750s. And you get the idea. It's an imperfect world. And the world loves itself. And so the world feeds on itself. It listens to itself. But you're not of the world. You gave your heart to Jesus who's not of this world, whose purpose was to redeem this world. You gave your life to Jesus. You're of him. So don't be surprised when they won't listen to you at work because it's coming from the world. Be thankful when you do find a brother or a sister in Christ, a relationship that is deep and intimate, that you can talk about these things and work through these things. Be grateful for that because they're of God and you're of God and it gives you the ability to discern because we all have these inclinations. We've got to understand what we gravitate to. We are from God, John said in verse six. Anyone who knows God listens to us. Anyone who is not from God does not listen to us. No surprise. This is how we know the spirit of the truth and the spirit of deception. We can tell the difference because Jesus changed our lives and we have a new inclination. There's a new center of gravity for us. And our gravitation pulls towards Jesus. And that pulls us away from the world. An unwavering truth happens when we're so in love with Jesus that all of the rest of this stuff just isn't appealing anymore. I mean, you don't understand it. You understand it at a base level. You've got your favorite food. You've got your favorite meal. You've got your favorite color. You can list every favorite thing in your life and every other thing that's not your favorite pales in comparison. All I am doing and all I think all of John is challenging us to do is know our God and let everything else pale in comparison. Be in love with Jesus. Yes, I dreaded the thought of missing being with you all this morning because I love our people. But the reason I love our people is I love our God. Jesus changed my life. I'm not saying I don't get tempted, I'm not saying I don't get pulled back sometimes. But at the end of the day, Being like Jesus is my deepest desire. And it's your deepest desire. And that's why we're happy to be together. Because we have that in common. And as we prepare to worship again and and, and close close out this service, I know every single one of us, all of us in here, we're going to leave out of here. We're going to go back into the world. And for a brief moment, for a couple hours this morning, you lived in an environment where it was safe, where it was comfortable, where it was familiar. But God called us as purveyors of truth. He called us back into that world. Because the only way I have this happiness now is because somebody left their sacred moment to come into my messed up world and say, James, Jesus can handle this. Jesus can take care of this. And I experienced a life-changing relationship with Jesus because somebody invited me to know him. And it changed everything. So yes, we are deploying back into a hostile world. But we're doing it because there are people behind the lines in that world that desperately need to know Jesus is an answer that we've not only experienced, but
but we believe in and hope for for them. Lord, send us. Send us into the world. Because the greatest way to, to bring truth is one-on-one -on -one with our friends, our co-workers, our family, as we introduce them into the God of truth, Jesus, our Savior.